Welcome to the Therapist Thrival Guide. My name is Miranda Barker. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I'm here with my co-host, Dr. Lucas Vellini. Hello. LMFT. Yep. And today we are jump- we are talking about teenagers, and so we brought Sarah and Emily. Do you want to go ahead and introduce, introduce yourselves? Sure. So I'm Sarah Livingston Burke. I'm an uh, LPCC, so Licensed Professional Clinical Counselor. I also oversee the Embedded Team, which is our school-based team that works with um, a, a elementary, middle school, and of course, high school, which would be those teenagers. In the in the schools. In the schools. Yeah, that's awesome. In the schools. That's perfect. I'm Emily Shack. Sorry, not Shack. Me, Weedenbach. I got married. Oh, and I also just sweared. So <laughs> that's great. That's a great way to start this. I'm so used to like just saying Emily Shackmuth and every, even like when I switched out over here, I was like, didn't even tell anybody. I no, probably should have told no. Sarah, but everything else is like changed and, and everything here. But it's Emily Wiedenbacher. Um, and I am working towards my LPCC. Nice. And I run the school based embedded program. I manage it. And I also see clients and kiddos in the school too. Awesome. So. Mm-hmm. so today, before we started recording, we were talking about how um I think we're gonna feel really old in this episode yeah. because we're all talking about teenagers. Obviously, none of us are teenagers. And you were talking about how you love working with teenagers They're because great. they keep you young and yes. keep you up on like the lingo and everything. I get to hear the new slang and then I sit there and I'm just like, well, there's a different word for that that I remember, but okay, you can continue. And then I have to ask them questions about what that means. And then I'm just <laughs> like, I'm going to write a little dictionary. And then it changes in the next oh, week. No. Oh, and no. I'm like, oh, that we don't use that word anymore? Okay, I'm so sorry. Literally, go. just a couple weeks ago, my teenage brothers were trying to explain to my dad in what context you should, you should use the word bet. Mm-hmm. And so... That's yes. that's where we're at with this. Yeah. But yeah. We, both of you love working with teenagers. Yes. Absolutely. And we wanted to talk a little bit more specifically about this population, building rapport with teenagers, and what are some of like the different issues that you're seeing teens face right now and how how you're helping them through those. Bet. Yeah, bet. bet. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no cap. Exactly. No cap. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> so oh. what do you love about working with teenagers? Why? How did you get started working with teenagers? It's a great question. Um, I was originally just kind of forced because I was like, I'm not working with anybody under 18. And then my supervisor was like, Haha, joke's yeah. on you. <laughs> okay, wait a second. Knowing you, that's yeah. surprising that you didn't want to work with. I know. I know. So I don't work with kiddos because I have things about parents. It's It's a whole thing. Um, but I love working, <laughs> just saying, <laughs> anybody under 10, anybody under 10, um, but 10 to 18, that's like my jam. And, um, I really like working with them because they're like exploring life. There's yeah. things that are new relationships are really intense and it's kind of like, okay, so there's a lot of drama in school mm-hmm. we get to talk about and all that kind of stuff kind of comes out and, when you hear about it and you get to kind of explore with them, it's like a new path or a new way of looking at things. And you're just kind of like, all right, all right, here we go. We're going to go through this path together as a journey. This is going to be fun. So that's that's why I really like working with teens is because they're just, they're on their, they're discovering new things in life. Yeah. And it's a little bit more adultish, but they're still in kind of that, yeah. you know, I'm questioning things. I'm yeah. questioning life itself. So Like little mini adults in training almost. Yes. Like that's how I've kind of viewed it as it's like they don't have like the skills yet obviously but we can like teach them some of these kinds of skills to kind of prep them for what it's like yeah in a sense yeah so I think it's fun so first question that I have for you too is how do you go about building rapport with teenagers typically great question yeah I usually I tap into a lot of their interests I love kind of partnering and forming that relationship in the beginning and letting them kind of take the like the driver's seat a little bit. Usually in the beginning, I'm kind of like, all right, let's figure out what you enjoy, what you like to do. And that's kind of like my launch pad. And Mm -hmm. then I take it into there. And then that's easy for me to kind of dive into it. I also think it's important for us to really highlight a lot of kind of the things that they're good at, especially when they're kind of discussing like their own parts or like Mm -hmm. the diagnostic assessment and kind of like tapping more into really what they truly enjoy, whether it is video games all day, every day, or whether it's like being involved in 20 different extracurriculars, mm-hmm. like the, they're like the really busy stuff and like the really like 
hey, maybe I'm not so busy, but like I really enjoy just my downtime in a yeah. sense. So I think it's really important to highlight a lot of the things that they're good at and to tap into just things that they just enjoy. Like mm-hmm. what's life like being a teenager? Yeah. If you could like have the whole day off, what would you do? Yeah. And what does that look like? Yeah, I think a mistake a lot of people make is they they dive into what the parents think that they mm. they should be doing or working on, and the kiddo's like, I don't think that's a problem. Mm. And I get that a lot. That That's something that I've worked with. But so with building rapport, it's a lot of, all right, these, I'm, I, in this session, I'm not going to be telling your parents what's going on. Mm-hmm. Here's the, the groundwork as to why I would have to tell mm. your parents something. But for the most part, no, we are not going to talk about it with your mom, your dad, your guardian, whomever. We're just going to sit here and I'm on your side. I'm mm-hmm. here to talk to yeah. you. And so I'm going to take the time a lot and, and exactly what Emily said it, and getting to know their interests. A lot of teenagers love horror movies, by the way. So I get to hear all about them, whereas yeah. I'm not a horror movie person. So, um, but talking to them about what they like to listen to, you know, who they're interested in, in just in general, um, different things that they like. You know, a lot of kid or a lot of teenagers are into anime nowadays. Oh, yeah. Um, and so I'm just like, well, tell me about anime. Like, mm-hmm. you know, educate me a little bit about this. Mm-hmm. And then we can kind of have that conversation and build that rapport. And usually with teenagers, that's the person or that's the, the population I'm going to take the most amount of time to build rapport with. If it's a month, if it's two months, you know, yeah. whatever, however long it takes for them to feel comfortable so that they're not coming in and being like, nothing's wrong. Mm -hmm. And they're just like, actually, everything's wrong. It's terrible. And I just want to go home and cry. But I'm not going to tell you that because Mm -hmm. you're going to tell my parents. So yeah, Yeah, I think step one's, you know, it's like, do they want to be there? Are they forced to be there? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Figuring out that first. If they're forced to be there, it's like, join them at that level. Exactly. You know, and just be like, all right, I get it. You know, it's like, that's what being a teenager is. It's like, you're, you're growing up, you're realizing you're free and you can make your own choices. Yet you're surrounded by all these adults constantly telling you what you can and can't do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. like that's a drag. Mm -hmm. That can suck. And a lot of these adults don't even know what they're talking about. Correct. (laughs) Yeah. Right. It's so true. Period. (laughs) Uh, So like normalize that, validate that, give them permission. And I think as a therapist, it's like you need to distinguish yourself from their parents, their principals, their teachers, like all the authority figures that they have in their life. It's like, we're not that. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, it's like, that's yeah. not what we're here mm-hmm. for. Right. Uh, we're something totally different. That's here just for you. Yeah. And so it's like, if you don't want to be here, it's like, I get it. Mm-hmm. I get like, it. But you're here. Mm-hmm. I'm here. Yeah, exactly. I'll show up if you do? show up. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and and the showing up is important in various different ways. How you dress, like I'll dress differently when I'm working with teenagers than when I'm working with adults. And it could just be like I'm a little bit more professional when oh, I'm working sure. with adults. But with teenagers, I'm going to dress t-shirt yeah. and leggings and just be like, let's talk. What's yeah. going on? And so that they get a little bit more comfortable in their mm-hmm. sense too. And then like just how I present myself, like that is going to change a little bit too. So yeah, it's it's how you show up too. It's if you swear or not. Yeah, you, yeah. That's my bad. I was like, <laughs> but I also think it's you like... You F-bombs. It's okay. <laughs> I do with my teens and they're yeah. just like... And I was like, eh, it's okay. Do you think you gain some credibility with it? I think a little bit. I, a little bit. I think some of them are like, oh my God, I'm like swearing. It's like, who's this person? I was like, with context and with reason, obviously. Yes. But yeah. I think it's so important too because those teenage years are so... It can be a, it can be messy, tumultuous. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. very, like you're figuring out what you want to do when you're older. People are asking you what you want to do, and you may mm-hmm. not know what you want to do. Like, where are you going to go to college? Are you going to Are you going to go to college? Mm-hmm. Like, there's a lot of stuff that happens during those years where I think it's so important to have somebody that's not like your parent, yeah, or like somebody in like your family member that's just like a neutral partner, mm-hmm. I guess, in you, and to kind of have somebody there where you can talk about the stressors of being a teen because yeah. it's not easy, kids are, you know, with bullies and just like developmental stuff and like social groups and like, is, there's a lot of pressure. And I think it's so important for everyone to just have somebody that they can, can confide in mm-hmm. when it comes to all this kind of stuff. And that feels really good when I'm working with teens that they are able to confide in this stuff with me. And it's like, I tell parents, I'm like, they're not going to trust me for like a month, maybe two months, maybe six months. It mm-hmm. doesn't matter how long it's going to take me, mm-hmm. but I'm, that's the building real poor piece that I think sometimes parents maybe struggle. It's like, well, Okay, like just go in there and fix, fix them. Fix them. Yes. You know? Quickly. Quickly. Yep. And I Change need it, their attitude. And I need it done in one session. Uh-huh. And it's like, well, that's not realistic. So right. whenever I do my intakes, I 
if I have time at the end, I'll stress that piece really Mm -hmm. much, like Mm -hmm. really much, but I'll stress it to a point where it's like, this is how this is going to work. I'm, this isn't a short-term therapy yeah. kind of thing. So, Unless you're looking for that, then we can talk elsewhere. Sure. But On that note, do you, when you typically do intakes with teenagers, do you have parents and teens in for the entire intake? How do you normally structure those? I think typically what I'll do is that I will have both in. And mm-hmm. then like at the end, I will leave some time to check in with just the kiddo. Okay. And then just the parent also. Yeah. So I'll have them there for like the bulk, like, mm-hmm. t- like together. And then for the end of the time, I'll check in with just the kiddo by themselves. Sure. And then just to give them time to be like, hey, what's, why are we here right now? Yeah. And like, or like, what's kind of driving this? And then mm-hmm. I'll also leave time for parents separately also, mm-hmm. just so I get everybody in a comfortable space. Mm-hmm. I think that's important. How often are you checking in with parents, uh, like throughout the treatment? It kind of depends on the kiddo and parent. It I have really, to say. Sure. yeah, and like that relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like some parents, they want a weekly check in. And yeah, and I'm just like, okay, that's fine. We can, yep. but you're going to get like two minutes of yeah. like, yeah, we talked. Have a great day. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's exactly what you're going to get. And then um, with others, it'll be, um, yep, we're having great conversations yeah. um, or this is something that we need to work on. Mm-hmm. But um, the content of it mm-hmm. is not going to be discussed. Yeah. Like that part of it is not. It's going to be, nope, we're doing great in session yeah. or we're struggling having conversations mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we're just working on it. And that's part of rapport building. Yeah. yeah. And absolutely. that's going to be my check-ins usually with the, the parents. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. I've got some that I'll, I'll kind of communicate with them, kind of how I communicate with parents during this time. Like I will connect with you for like a treatment plan signature mm-hmm. um, during our yearly DA update mm-hmm. that we have to do that. And like other business admin type of stuff when it comes to doing this work already. Sure. Um, and then of course, safety reasons and concerns as well. But mm-hmm. if there's, and I always ask them to how they want communication during this. So like, I'll tell them what I normally do, which is like my spiel. And then like, I'll ask them to how much involvement and how much are you yeah. wanting to partner on this? Because I think that's important. And then I'll take note of that. Kind of like how Sarah said, if you want to meet every weekly or every week for like a 15 minute check-in, we can do that. But what does that look like? Well, and I'd imagine so. it's different to in school-based work because the parents are not bringing the kid in. The mm-hmm. kid is being pulled from class, I'm assuming. Yeah. And so you really would probably need to have pretty good email rapport with yes. the parents, I'm guessing. Yes. Is, okay. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. they're at work. We're mm-hmm. doing kind mm-hmm. of like normal nine to five kind of stuff or whatever kind of they're doing during the day. So um, we tell all of our providers too, like also if you, need, if you need to connect with parents, use that after school time or like before school time if you can. Yeah. Some parents have access to their stuff during the work day, but obviously it's harder to like pop on a check-in for that kind of stuff. That makes sense. So you were just talking about like part of the the stuff that you're seeing and, and the issues that you're seeing teenagers bring into into your therapy room. What are, let's talk more a little bit, like a little bit more about that. I'm interested to hear, I'm guessing you're doing a lot of identity work. Yep. Um, I'm guessing you're doing a lot of relationship, social skill work. Tell me more about kind of what sort of things that you're seeing when working with teenagers. Yeah, a lot of the socialization. So working with with how to socialize with others and, and um, what to do when, you know, maybe friends kind of disappear Letting go of relationships. I bet you spend so much time talking about friendships. It's all about relationships. relationships. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a hot topic. It is. Always. You know, because it, it's very, again, that age is, there's hormones. There's a lot of things going on, right? <laughs> yeah. And so we're getting into fights every other week. Like mm-hmm. things are happening. And one day we like this person, but the next day we like this person. And it's it's very complicated. But um, it's getting to know like uh, ourselves and how we present in a relationship and these are the years where they're really going to absorb things and they're going to absorb, oh, this is who I am as a person and trying to find themselves in that before they go to college and have to do it all over again, yeah. mm-hmm. right? Or or just um, into the workplace. So, um, so a lot of relationships work, a lot of identity work, um, <clears throat> a lot of work within the LGBTQ plus community because um, there's a lot of questioning genders and questioning roles and in, in life and stuff. Um what other things are you saying? I would say, uh, trying to reflect back like a little bit, I would say a lot of it's social relationships yeah. and like just school, like mm-hmm. managing schoolwork, two extracurriculars, sure. doing like, you know, being like a basketball player. And like, there's a lot of like juggling. And mm. I think 
figuring out how to organize all this kind of stuff is really hard the for pressure. them. The pressure. The pressure. Perform. Yeah, the pressure yes. to perform and get straight A's while also being like a really like kick ass like yeah. basketball player. Yeah. So I get into the best college. Yeah, so I can get to the like, best like college. That matters. Yes, exactly. And I need to get all A's and I need to do well on all my AP tests so that I get into all this stuff. So it's like managing that. I would say that's the bulk. Well, as we kind of lead into the school year, that's a lot of my work right now too. I would say is focusing how the hell I'm going to manage all of this. Emily, I'm going to go nuts. Mm-hmm. So like and they can't. A lot of times they can't. They can. I mean, I yeah. made an Excel spreadsheet one time with a client mapping out their like 15 hour day on a mm-hmm. weekly basis. And they had like two free hours mm-hmm. yeah. on Saturdays. It was That's, insane. It's crazy. Yeah. And like part of that is just like laying it down with them and saying like, okay, walk me through your whole school day and like what your after school is like. Well, and when like, are you supposed to be doing, <laughs> when are you supposed to be doing homework? When are you supposed to be doing, having a job or doing extracurricular? Or resting or socializing or enjoying yourself or pursuing your passions. Yeah. You know, and it's like, and when they can't keep up, they and they beat the crap out of themselves. They do. They, they do. think they're not good enough. You know, yeah. it's like, this is an unmanageable, unattainable expectation that you've been thrown into. Yeah. It's like, this is the problem. Mm-hmm. This is insane. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people think that it's, or assume that it's parental pressures. No, it is a, Purely internal for a lot of Mm -hmm. these teenagers of going, okay, I need to be the best at this. I need to be a peer here. I need to take social media pictures that are just the best and and gorgeous. I need to be an influencer. Exactly. Like that's my job. (laughs) And it's like, no, 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 no. Right now you need to be able to screw up. You need to take the time. Like this is the time where you have the safe space to do things that are a little bit more challenging and yeah. and to be able to be like, no, 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 I get to take breaks. Like you have the rest of your life to do all these yeah. things. Go almost get arrested. Right, yeah. exactly, exactly. Like go well, do Do that. it while you're still under 18. That's right, yeah. under 18. Make all the mistakes. Preferably closer to 16 because then they can't try you as an adult. Oh, Whatever, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. we're not giving you advice. Like, <laughs> well, almost get arrested. Almost. I didn't say go get arrested. Almost. That'd be insane. Yeah. That'd be horrible advice yeah, for a don't, therapist. Don't get well, arrested. Just almost. Almost, yeah. How yeah. are you helping kids kind of sift through some of this stuff in sessions? It's a lot of it is taking time. Yeah. It's getting to know, uh, obviously, the building rapport. Yep. And then it's going, okay, so what do you think is the most important thing right now? Mm-hmm. Like, what do you what are you really finding that is taking the most of that brain space. Mm -hmm. And okay, let's sift through it. Let's Mm -hmm. talk through it. Um, Why do you think that that's important? Why why is that something you need to explore right now? Mm -hmm. Um, And so there's a lot of questions and and open-ended and, you know, helping them kind of process like why they think that's important. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you think you really need to share your, where you are at with all of your friends (laughs) on your phone? Is that important? Every day, (laughs) every day. Um, and so, um, mm-hmm. going over things like that and, and just kind of exploring with them. Yeah. yeah. I always ask them, I was like, what's the, what's taking up the most space right now in, in your brain? Mm-hmm. And that's where I start. Mm-hmm. Cause I know, like when they come in, it's like, I know there's, I'm, I know I'm going to hit a few different points, but yeah. what's, let's focus on what is taking up the most space right now and then take it from there. Mm-hmm. And then that kind of helps me kind of help them create like a roadmap as to how we're going to sift through these certain things. Like scheduling like a lot of my seniors have like their schedules that will like be like released in like a few weeks here so mm-hmm. it's like okay now planning for like my whole school day plus my job my extracurriculars applying to colleges I've got some seniors that will be applying to schools so like that's a whole nother ballpark of stress and we kind of just take it and piece it out because I think this is kind of touching back to that point where I said where they need someone to kind of talk about and process this kind of stuff with that isn't their parents because mm-hmm. yeah. it's so easy for parents to kind of jump in there and be like well this is what you should do. Yeah, yep. exactly. Mm-hmm. And it's like nice to have like a neutral partner in this. Oh, yeah. That's just kind of like, all right, Emily, here's what I'm struggling with. And I don't know how to work around it. And I love being that person mm-hmm. to kind of like be like, you can actually do this all on your own. I'm just here to like guide you through it. One of the things that I appreciate about teenagers is just how the the stigma around mental health just it doesn't exist as much as it has for their parents or grandparents. And so for a lot of them, they talk very openly about seeing their therapist, about their anxiety, depression, medications they're on, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know that you and I have talked about this a lot, but like, what do you think about, um, like, do you feel like we're going the other, the opposite direction in some ways where like some teenagers feel like it's weird to not have some sort of mental health um, disorder or like, like, um, you don't have a therapist, nerd, right? Yeah. Right? loser. That's what I feel like sometimes. Some yeah. They're not even in therapy. Hey, oh my goodness. <laughs> and I mean, 
we're all therapists here. Yeah. And so obviously we're very pro therapy. Yes. Yeah. But there is kind of this this interesting thing that has with some of my teenagers, it's kind of caused me to pause a little bit yeah. of like, are we swinging too far the other way? Yeah. You and I, or we were talking about before how like people with, there's generalized anxiety disorder mm-hmm. and then there's natural anxiety. Yep. And people think that they have generalized anxiety disorder and you're just like, no, no, no. Mm-hmm. That's a natural anxiety mm-hmm. just coming out. It's okay to feel stressed every once yeah. in a while. It's okay for those cortisol levels to go up every once in a Good. while. It's essential. Yeah, exactly. Like if you're not that, yeah. you're dead. Right. right. <laughs> exactly. And so anxiety, we it is okay to be like, oh, I'm anxious before a test. It does not mean mm-hmm. you have a generalized anxiety mm-hmm. disorder. It means you give a damn. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It means that you care about things. But I do agree that like all of a sudden you'll be like, oh, that's just my depression talking. And you're just like, but I never diagnosed you with depression. Yeah, but yeah. society so did. We, I mean, we've labeled them as like the mentally impaired like yeah. impaired yeah. mental health generation. Exactly. You know, it's like they see that everywhere. And like they're <laughs> the first generation too where it's like when we were growing up, we had no idea what was actually going on in the world. It's like we would have had to read a newspaper That's for that. That's true, right? Or like turn on the local news. Back when news was boring yeah. and not entertaining. That's like our new reality way too much TV. information. Like they, they have a... Mm-hmm. And so like we just assumed that the world was... It made sense eventually. Yeah. You know, it's like, we'll grow up and we'll be adults. Everyone mm-hmm. is mature. Everyone's reasonable. We'll get mm-hmm. a job we love. Things will be great. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's like this generation, they got a front row seat to the shit show. Yeah. yeah. Of what's yeah. ahead for them. Well, and that's one of the, so one of the teenagers that I'm working with right now, um, they, so many of the sessions recently that I've had with them have been around setting boundaries with the news, setting boundaries with social media oh, yeah, because they love politics. They're like in it. I know. Yeah. They were they were like I'm I'm writing to have you looked at this website where you can call your politicians and do yes. this and that. And I was like, like the this is amazing. Stuff. I yeah. love this. Yeah. And like, yes, let's fuel this passion and this like anger into something super productive and important. Like I love this. But there is kind of this this line where I'm like, okay, you are thinking about this all the time. This yeah. is consuming you. I mean, like the, this is making you anxious. This, and so then you're feeling like you need to be on medication, you know, like all of these different things where you're like, okay, how do we take a step back and number one, educate about like what's normal, what's, you mm-hmm. know, like some of these things are necessary. Um, you know, anxiety is necessary at times, but like what's outside of the realm of normal? At what point can we no longer cope What are the, you know, just, I think Uh that that's, that's the tricky thing for teenagers with me right now, um, is like over emphasizing or over identifying with some of the mental health issues that they're seeing on TikTok or something. Yeah. Well, like that is like kind of what I was going to kind of point out is like with TikTok and Mm -hmm. like social media, right? It's all like, yeah. are you sure I don't have this, Emily? Like I I looked this up the other day and I was like... I promise. I had a client come in recently, like recently, and said, "Miranda, I think I have borderline personality disorder." Yes. <laughs> and and I think I've mentioned this actually on the podcast before because I was like, "I don't think you do," but in in my head was thinking, "I think your mom does." But <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> you've heard it from other somebody else, was, like, you know, whatever. But then but then you kind of go, "Okay, tell me why you think that," yeah. and then there's. Sure enough, a TikTok comes up that they yes. learned about. And I'm like, great. I love that you're learning so much. But at the same time, like, this is causing you anxiety because you think that you have all of these things wrong with you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or yeah. trauma. Trauma is another one that I've mm-hmm. encountered where a lot of people are like, oh, that's just my trauma talking. I'm like, okay, let's unpack that yes. a bit. Okay. Again. Yeah. Um, and people tend to forget about big T and yep. little T trauma. Yes. And how... um, What do you mean by that? Okay, yes. So big T trauma would be like Mm life-altering, life-changing traumatic events. Plane crash. Plane crash. Yes, exactly. Um, And then little T trauma will be things that kind of happen that were kind of... And I'm not downsizing it, but kind of like a blip Mm -hmm. that kind of like, okay, so this happened and we're going to process it. We're going to move on. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be something that I'm going to think about maybe every day, every other mm-hmm. day. It's going to be something that's just going to kind of up and and then go away. Yeah. Um, and for some people, they tend to hyper-focus on that little T mm-hmm. um, and make it, you know, and change it into a big T in a way. Um, but a lot of teenagers I've seen are really taking in uh, and running with the little T traumas and going, oh, well, this is something that affected me and will continue to affect me. And I'm like, 
if you let it, mm-hmm. if you let it, mm-hmm. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not downsizing it. What I am saying though, is that you're allowing it to be something that's going to overtake and overpower your life at this moment. But it's something that in five years, you probably wouldn't remember if you, if you wanted to take time and process that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So things like that, that have been coming up. But a lot of my teenagers are like, that is a trauma event. And I'm like, is it? Is it? Okay. All right. So, so I feel Susie, like we need a different word for yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So Susie not talking to you at lunch is a trauma event. Yeah. All right, let's go from there. But that's part of a lot of stuff that Things they go through, huge. like day-to-day <laughs> stuff, right? Like day-to-day, it's like all these huge things that happen to me yeah. is like the world is ending. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And like, which is fine. Again, not downplaying it. These are very nope. big things to big go things. through and normal. However, let's take a look at it from a different perspective. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, let's zoom out. Let's, yeah. I mean, m- my high school boyfriend broke up with me and that sucked. And that I was sucks. really sad yeah. about that for a little while, <laughs> yeah. you know, and then and then you move on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. But, but back, I mean, was your life over my in life that moment? My life was over. Yeah, like it was done. It was right. over. There was no overcoming that. Wouldn't yeah. go to school. Like, no. it's just like, I, I don't. crying in my closet. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, sad That stuff, stuff. is hard <laughs> because like, but then that's one of those things like, heartbreak at like a young age right yes. and that's why I kind of like it's imperative to like talk to somebody during this kind of stuff it's yeah. like my dumb emily am i like what like what did i do wrong during mm-hmm. this like relationship it's like you didn't do anything wrong no and like there's nothing wrong with you at all by any i could have used you as a therapist there's emily nothing <laughs> there's nothing wrong with you i love saying that to teens I, you know yeah. it's like it's like you were just thrown into this world mm. without your consent mm-hmm. yeah. and this world makes no sense it's like mm-hmm. have you noticed how none of this makes sense, mm-hmm. how it's crazy and chaotic and no one seems to know what they're doing. And seems to be, you know, and it's coming like, more chaotic. Yeah. And it's like, yes. you're doing, it's like, you're doing your best to make sense of yeah. it. But it's like, I would, every time a teenager falls short or screws up or is on the wrong path, it's because a grown up in their life failed them. Yeah. Or yeah. disappointed them. Uh, yes. That's powerful, Lucas. Like saying mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with you yeah. to a teenager who feels like their body's changing, everything's changing. Yeah everything's wrong with them. How they acted in, in a relationship. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. like how they didn't make the basketball team or like got into like the D3, D4. I don't, I don't know what those mean, but like sports, sports, <laughs> sports. <laughs> but like, it's just like, it's a big deal. And it's like, there's, your grades are fine. You're a straight yeah. A student. Maybe you just struggle with a little bit of like test anxiety. Yeah. We all do, you know, yeah. it's like, it becomes like a personal attack mm-hmm. and that's really hard on them. Mm-hmm. Like, and everything stops. The whole world stops for this kind of stuff. Yeah, they need to really discern like where they're pursuing their self-esteem from. Yep. That's a that's a whole nother thing. Like yeah. oh, I social think, media. Well, with just I would assume that a lot of your teenagers are talking to you about self-esteem or yeah. having self-esteem yep. issues. Social media is a huge factor, but body dysmorphia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, the it's like a I mean, I just feel like the expectations of teenagers is is on a whole nother level. Mm-hmm. Um, and so interested to know like how you're tackling self-esteem with some of your teens. I think a lot of it is saying that you are enough. Like that, that is something that teens don't, they think they need extra. They think they need more. When it comes to self-esteem, it's definitely working on what do you like about mm-hmm. yourself? Like, let's start there. Mm. Let's work our way up from what we do like about ourselves and talk about that. Okay, yeah, we all have things we can improve. That's always going to be something that you might think about. Um, And so let's talk about what we do like right now. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, things that we want to change. Why? Mm -hmm. Why is that something? Is it because you saw something over here or you really are self-conscious about what this is. What if they can't come up with anything that they like about themselves? And that's, I've, I've We're not waiting that. until you yep. say three things about mm-hmm. yourself that you enjoy. Like, mm-hmm. cause I've had that often too before. Cause yeah. it's like, it's really hard. It's like, there are some things and I'll give you the time. I mean, we got the hour, mm-hmm. yeah. I'll give you the time. But like, I, uh, I think when those issues are presented, it's, they're not focusing on what they're good at. They're not focusing on their strengths that yeah. they're not. And maybe this is because they've never had an adult that's highlighted these Thank strengths mm-hmm. that you. has caught them being good. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, oh, yeah, it's like, or, yeah, that or, part is hard. Yeah. Or they're hearing their parents or their guardians say bad things about themselves mm-hmm. and they've picked that up and really taken it because yeah. that's what their parents know too. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's generational at that mm-hmm. point. So you have to kind of work through that a little bit too. Yeah, I would tell them, I'd make a deal that 
by the end of the last 10 minutes of this session, you either tell me three things you like about yourself or I'm going to tell you 50 things I like about you. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to love it. Yeah, I love but that. But it would be like so hard for them to stomach and tolerate. Yeah. Yes. Oh my goodness, yeah. And it wouldn't be hard to come up with. No, things. I love that idea. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Because yeah. they're just focusing on a lot of like what like they're not good at and yeah. what they strive to be, but they're not. And it's like, well, let's scale back. Let's talk about all these goals that you got. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about all these like good grades that you got. They're, it's become like a lot of their strengths have been hindered by a lot of maybe what society is putting on them. Yeah, totally is. arbitrary standards. Mm -hmm. You it know, is. it's like, so they don't feel good about themselves because they haven't lived up to this tier, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. in whatever respective domain. It's like, okay, so even if you did live up to that standard, why would that matter? Mm -hmm. right. Like, is there really any inherent value to this, to, to the standard that you're pursuing? And what do you think would happen if you did get there? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, right. and it's like, it's, so have them really, really come to terms with, they just internalize the value systems that surround them. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, so create a space where they can take ownership of what values they want to internalize and base their self-esteem off of and have them do it on their own terms. Right. You know, it's like getting straight A's. It's like, why? Mm -hmm. it's like, that's all made up. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like, it, it means nothing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean anything at all. Like, it does if you want to go to, like, an Ivy League school, but honestly, you don't want to. Mm -hmm. No. I don't think no. you want to the do that. I don't think you want to go to one of those schools. Yeah. <laughs> No. Well, it, it's so true because that, that pressure that we put on ourselves and the pressure that we um, internally feel that we think that people are putting on us um, just creates this hole of, I'm never going to be good enough. Yeah. I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to do this thing. And then that that just kind of creates more and more. And that's where depression really starts. Like mm -hmm. it's just seeping in there and getting into, and you're going to then have possibilities of mental health disorders mm -hmm. that have really um, fostered or festered as into your adulthood mm -hmm. at that time, because it, it gets to the point where it's like, well, I don't have what so-and-so has anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't have this. And it's like, did you, do you need that? Is mm -hmm. that something you desperately want or need? Mm -hmm. um, because you're fine the way you are. You're fantastic actually. Mm -hmm. So our focus should be to continue to kind of uplift yeah. a lot yeah. of yeah. our teenage population, I would say. Because that is what I'm seeing that's a large mm -hmm. kind of issue in a lot of what I've been working with for what feels like forever. But mm -hmm. it's there's not enough praise. There's mm -hmm. not enough like highlighting of the things that you are a rock star at. Mm -hmm. And that comes out in the self-esteem stuff that Sarah was kind of touching on. Mm -hmm. like, give, them, give them praise for the things that are overlooked and also give them a break. Mm -hmm. Catch yeah. them we're, break. When we're in areas that they've fallen short. Yeah. I also appreciate that you brought values up into it too. Because mm -hmm. I think like... It, looking at where their values are, why those, where those values come from, why they're held, and then challenging, not not necessarily challenging, but just like trying to dissect them a little bit, I think oh, yeah. can be helpful. A, every teenager is an existentialist. They just don't know it <laughs> You're totally because right. nobody's defined it for them. Uh, nobody's so brought them the language of being existentially curious. Yeah. And the reason why... <laughs> The vast majority of them don't turn into grown-ups that have, you know, existential inclinations is because that was just never nurtured. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it was never awakened. They were never given a platform where they could really explore those issues, but that's everything they're curious mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's like, yeah, that's I love getting existential with the teenagers. Yeah. And they think it's cool. Kind of they do think it's cool and it kind of stretches a little bit. Yeah. Like their cognitive kind of research. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Well, no, I, I love that. I think so many of them are open to having, you know, like asking those questions and diving into some of those more philosophical or, you know, just like things that I think grownups just seem to not want to touch. So if if I were a kid clinician, I would probably want to, you know, learn about play therapy, do these different things so that I could be a really good cl kid clinician. To be a, a clinician that really focuses on teenagers, what are some things that you recommend therapists learn or dive into or TikTok. books that you guys TikTok. that you would recommend <laughs> yeah instagram tiktok oh, irrelevant. i mean it, yeah yeah i mean that obviously it's that's a part of it and i think that's important i think what's really kind of what's been helpful for me is to kind of take trainings on different practices that you can take with teens, like different approaches and like mm -hmm. interventions and stuff. I'm constantly on the lookout for different kinds of things that I can use with my teens like during what? sessions. Like 
don't know. I'm trying to think of the one that I attended a few months ago. Like it's not, it's going to come to me at some point here, but I would say what's helping me like diversify it a little bit is kind of taking things that I've been learning to apply in session that makes it a little bit more or less scary for them. Mm-hmm. So like sometimes you're working with teens and sometimes they don't want to be there. Right. Mm-hmm. And I strive to make my office a kind of creative, non-judgmental space for them to kind of come into. And I think that is something that's very important for anyone that's going to be working with teens to kind of create, because if they're very intuitive, they're oh, super yeah. smart. Oh yeah. And they, they can sense something that's like as off or weird. It's uh-huh. just going to oh, make yeah. them. They can sniff out. They can like, sniff out anything. In authenticity. They from can. A mile really away. You're totally they can. Right. Yeah. And I think I, I, uh, that's one piece that I always try to do and I've always done when with like working with teens is making sure that my space is inviting mm-hmm. and that they have, they know that also that this is a space that they can come in and kind of be themselves mm-hmm. with yeah. like. It's like you get up every day to go be an adult. You put on your adult uniform, mm-hmm. you look proper, you head out and you get to the office, you perform all day and then you get home and like you just let all that off. You get to be yourself again. Mm-hmm. Like that's, that's the state of mind you bring into your work with teenagers. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. Not how you start your day as a grown up, but how you end your day by letting yourself become yourself again. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, like I would say, give yourself permission to be immature. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like that's our only mm-hmm. opportunity where we can really do it, where it's appropriate and, and effective, you know, but be mature enough to be Im- immature. Yeah. You know, that will go a long ways <laughs> um, and give them more permission to just be who they are. Yeah. I think a lot of my teens appreciate that. A lot of some feedback that I get from them is like, I feel really kind of comfortable because I don't feel like I'm in like a doctor's office. Yeah. And I don't feel like it's like this pressure to like, okay, tell me exactly what you're going through. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's not what I'm here for. Talk yeah. at your own speed. Yeah. I let a lot of them take the driver's seat in our sessions because these are your sessions. Mm-hmm. I want you to take this 55 minutes and do what you want with that. What do you want to talk about? What do you want to, how do you want to lay this out? And I think they appreciate taking a little bit of that autonomy and like Mm. that a little bit of like kind of me fostering a little bit like that independence during sessions, which Mm -hmm. is maybe they don't get outside of this also. So I'm like, all right, take the floor. Mm -hmm. What are we going to talk about today? Yeah, And (laughs) And then. And tell them about all the stupid shit you did yesterday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like tell them about, give them glimpses into how you still struggle. You're still Mm -hmm. imperfect. You know, you still fall short in a lot of ways, but then like, how do you cope with it? You know, what do you, what do you do in response to it? Mm -hmm. Um, And just kind of, you know, that, that, that differential that teens will put adults on or that adults entitle themselves to, you know, bethroning, um, take yourself off of that. Mm -hmm. Be human. Kind of like meet them where they're at. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I think you had mentioned that too a little bit earlier. How about it's really important to kind of meet them at where they're kind of seeing you from. Yeah. That's going to help with the rapport too. Yep. And, and taking the time just to understand that each teenager is a little bit different, like, right? So we have, and each of them are unique and whatnot. The one conversation I have with one teenager is not going to be the same that I have another. Like I have one that's like, let's talk about Taylor Swift. And I'm like, I'm all ears. Let's do this. <laughs> and then I have another one that's like, all right, did you watch Game of Thrones? Like, are you, and I'm just like, oh, whoa. Oh yeah. Yes. Yes, I did. I just don't remember. I am so sorry that you are now catching up. And like, we have that rapport where mm-hmm. I can just be like, sorry that you're young and you couldn't watch it when you were a baby, but I saw it already. Okay. <laughs> and like, and that's the conversations that we have yeah. where we get to have those like fun, like, all right, here we go. Mm-hmm. Because teens, I have to say, their main a good language for them is sarcasm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like just sarcasm. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, all right, let's get that sarcastic <laughs> hat on and let's go. Let's do this all day. And um, I think a lot of teens are, they appreciate the fact that like, we're going to use a lot of humor. Mm-hmm. And that is the value that I do use a That's lot with, with with teenagers is like, let's just laugh. Let's have a good time here. And then let's talk about what's really going on too at the same time. Yeah. And teenagers will ask you if you've ever smoked weed before. Oh yeah, they will. And so oh, just, just be prepared yeah. to say yes. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, I've yeah. never been asked that. That's funny. Really? Yeah. yeah. I, or, see, I don't see a ton of teenagers. Oh, okay. oh. I see mostly college students and like little kids. And then I have a couple of teenagers that just kind of like are on my caseload because of other things. And so... Um, but I've never been asked that. Or will you tell my parents if I tell you that I smoke weed? Yeah. And I'm like, no, oh my gosh, no I yeah. will not tell your parents. They're like, are you going to tell me this? Are you going to email my dad after Technically, this? Technically only a child protection report if the parent gave them the weed. Yes, exactly. Just to, exactly. Just to put just that, to out, put that there. out there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> 
and I'm just like, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say anything. <laughs> Which I think a lot of that too is helpful in the beginning because a lot of them, at least from my point of view, have been like, are you gonna tell my dad mm-hmm. that I said this? Mm-hmm. And I was like, no. Mm-hmm. These are the reasons why I would tell you your parents. Yeah. 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 I'm not a snitch. I'm a mandated reporter. Right. Yeah. I mean, those are two very <laughs> those different. Those are very different. different. Things. <laughs> I like and that. I and I constantly have that conversation because they're like, I just want to make sure. And I was yeah. like, right, but yeah. they're building that trust. Yeah. And that tells mm-hmm. me that. And I will, whenever that question comes up, I have like this flyer sheet that I use that says all the reasons why I would talk to your parents, you know, mm-hmm. like for like safety reasons, all that kind of stuff. Oh. It's like a visual. Yeah. And they're like, yep, I just forgot about that. And I'm like, nice. just remember that like, mm-hmm. I'm in your corner. Yeah. Like, that's where I'm going to keep it. Mm-hmm. This has been so good, you guys. Yeah. Um, any other last tips or thoughts that you have for therapists that are working with teenagers or wanting to work with teenagers? Oh, my goodness. Humor was a big piece. I'm yeah, so glad humor. we talked about that. Humor 100. is a big piece. Always the, the sarcasm. Yes. And having the ability to just kind of let your walls down mm-hmm. is so important. Like, keep that always. I think with teens self-disclosing a lot mm. more than with like adults um, is more helpful for the rapport yeah. building because they're going to yeah. ask you. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. They're going to ask you about mm. random things. They're going to ask you about like how you were as a teen yeah. and things like that. And I'm like, well, back in my day. <laughs> and then just talk about the early 2000s. Um, so and- I tell all of them I was varsity quarterback, yeah. star basketball player. <laughs> Notre Dame King, grad. Oh, yeah. Coming King. <laughs> yep. It was awful. I need, to, I need to get a better story, apparently. Yeah, you can just make them up. You can just make yeah. it up. Don't worry about it. And like yeah. your eyes get very big and you're like, you're talking to some hot shit right now. Yeah, don't yeah. worry about it. Yeah, I you're love welcome that. for being here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I say definitely read iGen. I think iGen's the most relevant book uh, hmm. for understanding the realities of what this generation of teenagers, you know, have grown up with and yeah. how like there are significant distinctions between this cohort and every other cohort mm. yes. that's ever existed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and iGen is because they're the first generation who never knew the world before the iPhone. Mm-hmm. And we all know very well how much the world transformed rapidly oh, yeah. you know, post-iPhone. Um, and enjoy them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love it. It's fun. Awesome. Keeps, keeps me my toes. Yeah. Thanks for joining. Thank this you. This was such a good episode. We'll have to have you guys back. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you.